Our third and final category of thermodynamic quantities is the response functions. The first was thermodynamic potentials, the second was state variables, and the third is response functions. We've already dealt with quite a number of response functions already, though we didn't really call them that. A response function is any quantity that is equal to the derivative of one state variable with respect to some other state variable. So it measures or represents how much a state variable changes as the others are varied or kept constant. So the definition of any response function is the variation of one state variable with respect to another state variable. Remember our state variables are s, t, p, v, mu, and n. If we have a more complicated system, then there's only, uh, it only changes by having more mu's and more n's. So what's an example of a state variable Here's one that we've used for a while, heat capacity. Remember that we can write an expression for the heat capacity at constant volume in terms of a derivative of the entropy with respect to temperature. So that's the definition there. And what do we have? We have a state variable changing in the numerator a state variable changing in the denominator, and two other state variables held constant. So heat capacity at constant volume is a response function. It describes how the material system responds to the changing of one of its state variables. So we can probably expect that the other heat capacity is also a response function. This is the heat capacity at constant pressure. The variables in the derivative are the same, but different things are held constant, and that makes it have a different value, Pn versus Vn. Let's see if you can guess one other response function. It was actually one of the very first quantities we introduced in the semester. Give yourself a pat on the back if you guessed the coefficient of thermal expansion. What does this tell us? It tells us how the volume of a substance changes as its temperature is varied. So again, two state variables. Conventionally, for a thermal expansion, we hold the pressure and number of particles constant, since that's what we would do most often in a lab setting. So coefficient of thermal expansion. is a response function. Now there's one more in the set of standard response functions. I don't know that we've uh, necessarily uh, discussed this one in class a lot. But it is in the textbook, and it might have shown up in, in a couple of exercises. This response function is uh, given the symbol kappa. It is the, a measurement of how volume changes as uh, the pressure changes on a substance while keeping its temperature constant. Uh, this response function is called the compressibility. And it makes sense, right? If you, if you put more pressure on an object, 
generally its volume changes. Uh, for most normal objects, putting pressure on them makes their volume shrink. So this derivative should really uh, come out negative to make uh, normal uh, sense for a material. Uh, so we put a minus sign in front of here purely as a matter of definition so that the compressibility value kappa comes out to have a positive value. These four response functions are called the standard response functions. Now notice what variables are involved here uh, when something is varied. So both heat capacities involve changing uh, the entropy by doing something, always changing the entropy by changing temperature. But what variables are held constant? Here we have a temperature variation while volume and number are held constant. And if we think what we would have to do to make this derivative work, we would have to express entropy in terms of T, V, and N. Those are the set of natural variables for the Helmholtz free energy. So we'll find out in a bit that the heat capacity at constant volume is actually closely related to what the Helmholtz free energy function is doing. For the uh, heat capacity at constant volume, we have temperature, pressure, and particle number. Those are the natural variables for the Gibbs free energy. So Cp is closely related to the Gibbs free energy. If we look at the two uh, volume response functions here, both of them are derivatives of volume but with respect to different variables. Uh, so these both have T, P, and N as their important independent variables. So these two are both also related to the Gibbs free energy. So I find it kind of uh, interesting that, uh, you know, these very basic concepts that you even might hear about in general physics courses are actually closely related to these uh, very abstract thermodynamic potentials that are far away from regular energy, right? Helmholtz and Gibbs um, are not something that you would just make up in a, in a, in a weekend, right? So let's go through uh, that relationship and write it out in more detail. Let's try to make that relationship quantitative. Uh, so with heat capacity at constant volume, we did an expression for the entropy uh, that relates it to the Helmholtz free energy. And if we think about the Helmholtz free energy's uh, formula for dF, I won't write it out here, but the natural variables were T, V, and N. So my derivative here, dF dt, at constant volume and particle number will be equal to the opposite of the entropy. All right, I, my little mnemonic for memorizing those is uh, I always remember that the fundamental thermodynamic identity for the internal energy is all extensive differentials. And uh, they're all positive except for pressure. So when I go to a different thermodynamic potential, if I change variables from S to T, then it flips the sign of that term. So that's how I know there's going to be a negative S here. OK, so plugging that in to the uh, formula for the heat capacity at constant volume, then we will get the Cv equals minus T times the second derivative with respect to temperature of this Helmholtz free energy function. All right, so that's kind of beautiful, right? You've got this Helmholtz free energy function. If you plot it like a two-dimensional surface uh, versus temperature on one axis and volume on the other one, you get this two-dimensional surface. And a second derivative is related to the, the curvature, the concavity of that surface. So you've got this really abstract thermodynamic potential. It's curvature. Oh, that's the heat capacity. <laughs> it's, it's so neat. Let's look at the other ones. For the heat capacity at constant pressure, I'm going to be looking at the Gibbs free energy. The derivative of Gibbs, G with respect to T, temperature, is also negative S because it's also got that flip from S to T. So this is going to be negative T, D squared G, DT squared at constant pressure and particle number. Okay, so for the uh, heat capacity at constant pressure, it's the curvature or concavity of the Gibbs free energy function.
For the next one, let's actually first do the bottom row here, the compressibility. Here I'm looking at volume, and the variables are pressure, temperature, and particle number. So this is going to come from, again, the Gibbs free energy. And for Gibbs, uh, I'm doing a derivative with respect to pressure to get volume. Normally, this term is negative. Since I flip from V to P, then I'll get that positive sign. So dG dP is going to be positive volume. So I'll have a minus 1 over V here from the definition. And then a second derivative of G with respect to pressure. All right, so another relationship between this uh, abstract thing and a concrete thing. Gibbs free energy, you plot it versus temperature and pressure, it makes some you know, two-dimensional surface plot. The curvature on one axis is CP, the curvature along the other axis is the compressibility.